Good morning, everyone. I'm Philip Below, and this is my colleague, Alex Kennedy. We have 10 minutes between us, and the main thrust of what we want to say about um, how we think mental illness changes the experience of carers, uh, the main thing is going to come from Alex's presentation, uh, which must be longer. So that leaves me three minutes to cover um, introducing the session, uh, giving my credentials, and describing we think mental illness, the charity of that name. And I've used up probably a minute and a half so far, so what we decided I would do is in, in introducing the session, Session. By the way, I'm chair of We Think Mental Illness and I'm also a carer. What we thought I, I should do, I think I've got one and a half minutes left now, is to actually relate my carer's journey, as that means my son's journey, as someone with schizophrenia, uh, to what happened between us and We Think along the way, and that illustrates the sort of things our charity does. So, my, I've been a carer for my son, my schizophrenia, for 22 years. When I first suspected that this is what was wrong with him, I ran on advice. I ran a Rethink Mental Illnesses Advice and Information Service, and they were enormously helpful, and they take thousands and thousands of calls each year. One of the things they advised was that I should join the carers group, and that's one of the things that Rethink also provides. We have 150 peer support groups for carers, for service users, and some for both. Uh, attending a carers group, I became very much aware, or more aware, of the injustices and the stigma that go along with people who are suffering severely from mental illness. And I wanted to help with campaigns. This was probably at the point I became a member of our governance. Uh, you'll hear more about our campaigns. But I think that they are probably what we're best known for in the country. And the more you go along this journey, the more you're aware of all the services you need, like Alison was talking about services in the community. And Rethink funds about 150 services, which range from crisis houses to advocacy, via employment services, um, uh, supportive housing, and so on. Okay, I'm, I must have overrun with my three minutes, so I'd like to introduce Alex, who's our head of campaign. So, as Philip mentioned, we think mental illness as an organisation works in a number of different ways, through services, through good groups, and also through campaigning. And as the head of campaign and public affairs at we think, I sort of very much see myself and us as an organisation as campaigners. Um, people sometimes have a funny view of what a campaigner is, and that it's all quite funny, now I should be changed for bulldozer, or, you know, holding one of those placards saying down with this sort of thing. And if it's the most effective thing to do, we will sometimes do those things. But I think we have actually, we can be not just we think, but actually as a whole sort of sector and as a community of people who care about, um, care for, and are people severely affected by mental illness. We've done quite well, and I wanted to learn about influencing, but there's still quite a long way to go. I wanted to talk about two issues in particular. The first is, uh, as, as Alison was just talking about, the new NHS long-term plan. I think that we, um, all of those voices that have helped to shape that plan, have been, there have been a lot of loud and very clear and well-evidenced voices saying that actually community mental health services haven't been well enough resourced until now and that's going to change and also that there needs to be far more in terms of linking you know linking through uh, the improvements you know, so that improvement within the NHS aren't then left on their own on a peak surrounded by a lack of services elsewhere so I think as an organisation I'm proud of the fact that we did a lot to shape that debate to draw together the evidence and the views of carers and people who uh, have mental illness to show that that's what's needed. Um, and I think we're now sort of transitioning into the next stage, and this is where there's a really important opportunity, really, which is about shaping what should those services look like in different areas. And there are a lot of opportunities, there are a lot of um, options around how to do that, um, and just taking a couple of ideas 
you know, if there were going to be care navigators or link workers actually speaking to carers, carers will often say, I wear a lot of hats, you know, I'm sort of researching the condition, I'm being a sort of amateur psychiatrist, the cook, driver, doing all these sorts of things, but perhaps more than anything, trying to navigate all of these different systems. You've got more professionals who are able to help do that, that relieves a burden, but could those people also be helping carers to get the support they need too? Um, and similarly, and I'm where I'm short of time, but co-production should be linked through the whole thing too. Um, finally, um, the, so, so that's the first issue, is the long-term plan. We've done really well so far, but there's a lot more to do to, to work out what it looks like kind of on the ground. The second is the Mental Health Act. I think for as long as we think mental illness or National Schizophrenia Fellowship, as it first was, has been around and been campaigning, a form of the Mental Health Act has kind of always been on the agenda. And some research that we did, which involved a survey of 8,000 people, including thousands of carers, and people who've been done, detained under the Act, played a really key role in getting the review of the Mental Health Act that concluded in December. Um, I'm really proud of the role that we played as an organisation, both sort of staff like me and I, I've worked on the working group on, on issues around care and family involvement and on advocacy as well. But also by supporting carers and people with lived experience of mental illness to be very actively involved in that process. Just to speak very briefly about some of the recommendations for carers and families in particular, um, the review has recommended that of moving away from a nearest relative model where you're selected by that person who's got statutory role is selected from a set list to a model where if the patient service user has capacity, they can choose that person. Also looking at information sharing, people saying that when they're unwell, they might say that they don't want any information shared, but when they're well, they might have a very different view so that it, might, it could be possible to say in advance, in, a, in an advanced decision, actually, I, I do want my, my information to be shared, and I've got capacity to say that. Um, also about more involvement in treatment decisions. At the moment, uh, the ne nearest relative world is very focused at the point of detention and potentially at the point of discharge. But why can't there be more involvement if the patient wants it throughout the journey? Um, and finally, better advice and support for carers. Um, and uh, whether they're nearest relatives or not, or nominated people as it will be or not. And I'm really interested to hear more later about the REACT tool because one, it, it leaves, the review leaves open the question of what that better advice and support should look like, like in practical terms. So it's really good to hear that there are kind of ideas being developed that could potentially link into that. Um, I guess the, the final thing I really want to focus on is that campaigning, however you want to do it, and it, whether that's placards or whether that's attending sort of local decision making and co-production uh, forms or, or all those different things, can make a difference, can be very frustrating at times, um, but I, I really sort of encourage anyone and everyone to, to get involved in doing that because there's still a long way to go. The long term plan hasn't you know, made those differences yet. We haven't got legislation yet in terms of the Mental Health Act. We haven't due to have a white paper by the end of the year, but there's going to be an awfully long way to go. But I'm filled with some confidence that there are a lot of people with a lot of very strong views and who are very good at expressing their views, we can keep kind of pushing the system in the right direction. Thank you. I just wanted to say that my son now, after 22 years, is psychosis free. He's on a very good medication and has had other psychological treatments that have been mentioned. Uh, but he is left very cognitively damaged by his illness in terms of short-term memory, in terms of concentration, and in terms of planning and so on and so forth. People are nodding, I think people recognise the phenomenon I'm talking about. So maybe it's an elephant in the room, but let's bring it out. What happens, and this is, the, I would say, the main care of preoccupation, eventually after 22 years, when you get to my age, what happens when you're gone? How is, perhaps, how will we think this place to help my son when I'm gone? How are all you people who work in various sorts of uh, services, including the community services we've been hearing about from Alison. 
So I just wanted to say that question hangs in the air, and perhaps that is the way we would judge the success of all that we're doing.